there are many things that we must worry about and manage for our patients in the ICU. One common and certainly critical one to manage would be their airway, which I'll discuss some in this lesson here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. So for a variety of different reasons, our patient's airway may become compromised, whether it be from some physical issue or obstruction, or even a change in their mental status that no longer allows them to protect their own airway. When these issues come up, oftentimes they're quick and they require emergently putting interventions into place to continue to protect their airway and ultimately help facilitate their breathing. Now, these interventions can be simple things, such as positioning the patient and their head and neck, sitting them upright, having the patient cough, suctioning, etc. But sometimes these are not enough and may warrant utilizing special pieces of equipment to ensure that they have patency of their airway. So in this lesson here, I want to review over some of the basic pieces of equipment that we have for airway management before diving into some more in-depth topics. To go along with discussing each of the different pieces of equipment, I am going to put up a diagram here of our patient's upper airway, and this is going to help you to understand where each one of these devices are going or actually sitting within our patient's airway. All right, so the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be our oropharyngeal airway or our OPA. So this piece of equipment is one that you're going to come across and use frequently. So it's actually made from either a hard plastic or rubber, and this is going to be inserted into their mouth here with the end resting at the back of their tongue. Now it has several purposes that we're commonly going to use it for. First, it helps to keep the patient's airway open by keeping the relaxed tongue from falling back and closing off their airway. So this is going to be really important for patients who are post-anesthesia or who are unconscious and just unable to protect their own airway. Because it sits far back in the mouth, if a patient is awake, either awakening from anesthesia or they're just not unconscious, then having this in is often going to induce gagging and really could lead to vomiting, making things worse. So really important to know that this particular device should really only be used in unconscious patients. Now, if you have an unconscious patient who has slowed or stopped breathing, you should always insert an OPA if possible to utilize the bag valve mask as it is going to help to keep that airway open and really help to facilitate ventilating the patient. Now, in addition to keeping the tongue contained, it also can allow for better suctioning of the back of the mouth and throat, allowing us to clear out any secretions that may also be interfering with their airway. And then also, because it's rigid, it actually makes an effective bite block. So this can be used for patients with seizures or also patients who are intubated, keeping them from biting down on their ET tube. Now, prior to insertion, you do want to ensure that you do have the correct size. They do come in multiple sizes, and ensuring that you have the proper size really just takes a second to do. So here's an example of doing the sizing, but basically you want to place it against the side of their mouth with the opening at about their lips, and then the tip of the curved section should come to about the angle of their mandible. Once you have it sized, to insert it, we want to enter the patient's mouth at either a 90 or 180 degree angle, so upside down essentially, or sideways. Insert it until we're past the tongue and almost completely inserted before we turn it around upright. So the curved portion of the OPA should match the curve on the roof of the patient's mouth. And then the very end of the OPA is going to be resting right up against their mouth. So one important thing to know is that the OPA is a short-term solution. 
and really further airway management should be considered if the patient isn't improving. All right, so the next one I wanna talk about is gonna be our nasopharyngeal airway or the NPA. This is something that's also sometimes called the nasal trumpet simply because of its appearance here. But this is another adjunctive piece of equipment to manage our patient's airway, much like the OPA. This one though is actually made of a soft, pliable rubber. The NPA is gonna be inserted via their nostril and actually rest in their posterior pharynx. So this is gonna to help to maintain a patent airway and allows our oxygenation and ventilation for patients without really stimulating that gag reflex like the OPA does. So this really actually makes for a good choice in patients who are semi-conscious or even alert. Again, it's not gonna be comfortable having this thing inserted if you are alert, but it's gonna be much better than having that OPA in place. This is also useful in cases where an OPA just can't be inserted, such as patients who have facial trauma, angioedema, things that would really prevent its use. And then another nice thing with the NPA is it actually helps to facilitate NT suctioning. So it's going to have a pathway already in place without the repeated trauma of inserting the suction catheter. We can just go right through the nasal trumpet. Now, some important distinction here is that the NPA is not going to prevent patients from biting down and still may be inhibited by a relaxed tongue covering the airway. And then, once again, this is a temporary solution just like the OPA. Now, for this, they do also come in different lengths and sizes in a French scale, although the length is really a more important factor to proper sizing than the actual size of the tube itself. So for this one, to get the correct length, we actually want to measure from the tip of the nose to their earlobe. Now, prior to the insertion of the NPA, lidocaine jelly can be used. And then from there, we want to actually use some sort of lubricating jelly for the insertion. We want to make sure that the bevel end should be facing the septum when we are inserting it. And then once inserted, the flange of the NPA, that this is going to rest right up against the nair once it's fully inserted in there. Now, because of the route of insertion, we do have risk of nasal trauma and bleeding from the insertion. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be our laryngeal mask airway, or our LMA. Now, this piece of equipment here, it really isn't commonly used in the ICU depending on where you work, but I did want to mention briefly about it. So this can be actually inserted blindly into the mouth and then it rests in the hypopharynx. So what it does is it creates a seal around the glottic opening, allowing for ventilation. Now it's more commonly going to be used as a temporary airway to ventilate patients in the OR. That said, there have been more uses showing up in some ICUs, emergency departments, and even the pre-hospital setting. So the LMA can be quick and helpful in getting airway assistance after we've had either failed attempts at intubation or in patients who just can't be ventilated. And then once again, the LMA is another temporary adjunct and it really should be changed out if prolonged ventilation support is going to be needed for the patient. All right, next I want to talk real quickly about the esophageal tracheal airway. And so once again, this piece of equipment here isn't something that's commonly seen in the ICU, and it's really especially useful in the pre-hospital setting. But this is essentially a double lumen airway that we can easily insert into the patient's esophagus. We have one balloon that's going to be inflated closing off the esophagus, and then another larger balloon is inflated sealing off the upper airway, essentially in the mouth. So this allows us to ventilate the patient without any air entering the stomach or escaping back out. All right, so the next is actually a collection of a couple different types of pieces of equipment for airway management, and these are going to be our artificial airways. So the first of these that I want to talk about is actually going to be our endotracheal tube, commonly referred to as the ET tube. So I will actually be discussing these more in depth in the next lesson here, but the ET tube is used when an airway needs to be established for longer periods of time. Now these are made of a bendable, more sturdy plastic, and it's going to be inserted directly into their trachea, so through their vocal cords. So once inserted, a balloon, or what we refer to as a cuff, is inflated at the end of the ET tube inside the trachea. So this seals the trachea to prevent any air leak and really helps to hold it into position. That said, we do also secure them in place with either tape or a special holder such as the Hollister Anchor Fast. Now the ET tube offers us a very secure airway that allows us to properly control ventilation for our patient. And then our ET tube can actually be inserted either through the mouth, which is going to be the most common use, but it can also be inserted through the nose first before passing through the vocal cords and into the trachea. 
Now there are several different sizes that we record in millimeters and they range all the way from 2.0 all the way up to 12.0 and these come in 0.5 millimeter increments. Now for adults, women most commonly are going to be a 7.0 or a 7.5 whereas men generally are in the range of a 7.5 up to 8.5. Now the length of the ET tube is actually going to be proportional to the size that we use. Now once it's inserted there are markings to measure the length at which we actually have it inserted to. Now our ET tube can be used for temporary short term use but they can also stay in for extended periods of time. Now while the amount of time for this is actually debated generally after anywhere from two to four weeks, if not sooner in some cases, that we're gonna be considering a longer term surgical airway. There are risks and complications that come from being intubated for a prolonged amount of time. That said, there definitely are times where we've had them stay in for longer periods as well, as well as other times where we've moved to surgical airways uh, much quicker than this as well. In general though, most patients on average are really only intubated a few days. All right, and then the other type of artificial airway that I wanna talk about is actually gonna be our tracheostomy tube. So the tracheostomy tube is a surgically placed airway. So here, either an incision or a percutaneous puncture is gonna be made in the anterior trachea, and then the tracheostomy tube is gonna be inserted in there and secured. Now there's often a cuff at the end to help close off the airway to leaks. And then from there, we have an inner cannula that's gonna be inserted via this tracheostomy tube, which is something that can be removed, exchanged, and cleaned periodically. And this is actually where the tubing for the ventilator attaches to. The tracheostomy tube is often gonna be used in cases where we have a prolonged airway management and or ventilatory support is gonna be needed. Now these can be used quote unquote short term to help facilitate longer times that it's taking to liberate patients from the ventilator or a tracheostomy tube can actually be permanent and patients can stay with this tube in place outside of the hospital even. So a big advantage of the tracheostomy tube is that it's much better tolerated by patients and then after some time, many patients are really gonna be able to be awake uh, on a ventilator without any sedation. Now, there are many different types of tracheostomy tubes from cuffed to non-cuffed, single and dual cannula, fenestrated, non-fenestrated, as well as different sizes, shapes, and lengths. And really, they all vary based on the purpose and the different manufacturer. And then in general, it's really not uncommon for patients who've been intubated and on a ventilator for an extended period of time to make the transition to a tracheostomy tube. All right, so that covers the different devices that we have for airway management in our patients in the ICU. Each one has a different purpose. Uh, they definitely are critical pieces of equipment. It's really important for you to have an understanding of what they are, how to use them, when and why you would use the different pieces of equipment. Some of this stuff like the endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy tube, I am gonna be going over more in depth in future lessons, so definitely stay tuned for that stuff there. But hopefully this kind of gives you a basic understanding of the different devices and things that we have available to us for managing our patient's airway. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.